So, uh, let me introduce the first keynote speaker this morning. Julia Wagemann comes from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. She's been working there a few years, currently doing a PhD on the same topics. Julia, welcome. You have the floor. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm quite surprised to see so many after seven hours of open bar. Um, so, <laughs> really good. Um, so, yeah, my name is Julia. I am a visiting scientist at the moment at ECMWF. I'm also doing a PhD at Marburg University. And for the next 20 minutes, I would like to um, uh, put your attention to metrologic and climate data because they're openly available and they're ready for you to use. And I also would like to use the opportunity to talk, uh, to, to talk about some aspects about open data. Um, but before I start, who actually knows who, uh, what ECMWF is, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts? Please raise your hands. It's really hard to see, but uh, okay. Okay, so a few. Um, okay, that's, that's already good. So um, ECMWF is primarily a numerical weather prediction center. We provide weather forecasts to national meteorological services. Um, and, but we also um, are operate two Copernicus services, the Copernicus Climate Change Service and the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. And because of these two services, we have also now a full range of open environmental data available. We have, for example, uh, data on climate available. Um, the most popular um, data set is the ERA-5 reanalysis, which just has been published at the beginning of this year. Um, it is hourly data on a 30-kilometer spatial grid, and it's going back so far until 1979, but it will soon go back even until 1950. And we also have seasonal forecast data, monthly forecast data, um, up to six months ahead. But we not only have climate data, we also have um, air quality data, and this is quite recent because of the wildfires in, um, in, in the Amazon area. Um, so this is um, a biomass um, a, a fuel index, uh, which we see here, and um, so it's really helpful to monitor the impact what's actually happening um, there. Um, and we have different parameters on air quality, on ozone, on carbon dioxide, on nitrogen dioxide, and um, we have reanalysis data, they go back until 2003, but we also have forecast data, three hourly forecasts up to five days in advance. But it's not um, everything. We also have data on fire danger. We provide a series of um, fire, weather indice, uh, fire danger indices, for example, fire weather index or fine fuel moisture code, um, and they help you um, uh, better to assess the possibility um, of, uh, of fire occurrence um, somewhere. And uh, last but not least, we also have very good data on flooding, so in specifically um, river discharge information. Um, we have forecast data for there um, daily on a 10 kilometer spatial grid, and we uh, also have a reanalysis going back until 1981. Um, so we have this, uh, and the good news is that these data are um, all full, free, and open um, available under Copernicus. Um, that's exciting, isn't it? So, um, but uh, in preparation of the talk, I was thinking about, like, um, some people already asked me, uh, okay, what does it actually mean, full, free, and open? And um, I looked up some, uh, like, a definition of open data, and I uh, found um, a definition from the European Data Portal. And um, what I uh, found very interesting is that um, they um, said that aspects like format, structure, and machine readability make the data more more usable, but they also said that um, it does, it, these do not make the data more open. And I want to actually turn around this question today and ask, do aspects of non-interoperability, so that data are not easily inter-exchangeable between systems, or data complexity, so we have, uh, yeah, the structure of the data is complex, um, we have complex metadata, it's hard to understand, and community-specific formats, so do uh, these aspects make the data less open? 
So when I started, uh, when I joined ECMWF, I was involved in a, a project uh, where we, uh, so we knew that uh, the open data, we, it's growing in volume and it's getting harder and harder to actually download the data. And so I was involved in a project where we investigated um, how we can actually provide um, a better on-demand um, access to the data based on uh, data standards. So we implemented a web coverage service for climate and meteorological data. And this, look, this is how my day-to-day -day work looked like, because I um, tried to fit in meteorological and climate data um, into standards and also into a technology which was primarily um, uh, developed for um, Earth observation data uh, and satellite images. But it worked, so we, uh, we, it, um, and we, we also see the potential for um, web coverage services and um, standards. Um, so, but it also showed me that like working with different partners in the project is, despite the fact that we uh, probably talk about, we, we, we speak the same language and we also use the same terms, it often also doesn't mean that we actually have the same meaning for these terms. And so I would like to share with you today five facts about the meteorological and climate community to better understand um, uh, um, us. So uh, the first fact is big data is not a new term. So if we define big data just by the sheer amount of data, um, ECMWF is quite experienced in handling, storing, and archiving large volumes of data. We have the Metrological and Archival Retrieval System. It's uh, called Mars Archive. And it's um, having, so in the Mars Archive, we have more than 250 petabyte of data um, uh, stored, and it's uh, the large ar largest archive of meteorological data worldwide. The second fact is, operational means really operational. There are a lot of services and uh, projects out there, they claim to be, uh, to have an operational service um, uh, by yeah, offering data support within 24 hours only on work days. Um, for ECMWF and the metro meteorological community, operational means it has to be up and running 24 hours and seven days a week. Because forecasts, they can save lives, so it's very vital to disseminate these uh, data and information in time. The third fact is we talk about fields and grid points, not bands and pixels. So um, uh, the forecast data are produced on an octahedral grid. And so forecast data are basically just um, valid for this one specific grid point. And uh, if you retrieve data on a regular latitude longitude grid, it's important to know that the data between two grid points, they, they have been interpolated. And the real forecast value is just valid for this specific grid point. The third fact is standards and interoperability are no new terms. So we have a common data format uh, the meteorological community likes. Um, it's the GRIP uh, format. And uh, this is like a very exchange data format to inter-exchange data, meteorological and forecast data between meteorological organizations. And so um, it's, 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 it's very efficient data format, but it can mean that people who are not familiar with GRIP format, it might, it might, meet, need, uh, it might mean that you um, have to invest some uh, time to actually better understand and how to handle it. Um, but uh, for expert users and for national meteorological services, it's not a big deal because this brings us to fact five. We like custom-built software developed in-house because this helps us to tailor um, yeah, the software specifically to our needs and also to um, make um, uh, the handling of grip data very efficient. And for ECMWF core users and um, expert users, like trained meteorologists, um, uh, employees from national meteorological organizations, um, this is, it, it, it's not a big deal and it's, it's very good because m m many work on Linux workstations. But we also, um, there, we see a trend now with Copernicus. They are like a large uh, user community. They're actually interested in the data um, and this, this, this can um, lead, lead to a problem. And so um, uh, this is also what uh, the European Commission um, found out. They published a report, uh, the Copernicus Market Report, at the beginning of this year. And they um, state that number one trend is that they see a diversification of users and their demands. 
but the definition of users is um, is quite um, arbitrary, I would say. Um, probably if I ask 10 people here, like, who is a data user, I probably get 10 different responses. There are different terms out there, um, what users um, can be. So there can be an end user, there can be decision makers, uh, intermediate users. But the problem with um, users, if we try to actually match them on um, what level of the geospatial processing chain they probably belong to, so it's, the pyramid is going from raw data on the bottom up to pre processed data and then uh, generating more information, it's very uh, um, uh, difficult to actually match. And also probably it depends on the level of um, experience how you um, would uh, put specific users. If someone has a lot of experience using uh, geospatial data and um, uh, developing software, if someone who just um, developed workflows in Python, uh, maybe you would put him or her as an intermediate user. But someone who uh, just heard about geospatial data um, and uh, uses uh, yeah, um, uh, GIS systems, and, um, and then someone compared to someone who already uh, develops workflows in Python, um, he or she is already uh, much more advanced. So uh, the point I want to make is like it's very vital to actually understand um, who are the users um, because then systems and also the, the data can be better opened up, but at the same time is also like uh, very challenging. So um, there are some few challenges. So if we go back to meteorological and climate data, um, new data users, they might face uh, new, uh, some challenges. And one of the uh, um, most important challenge, I would say, is data complexity. So we all knew about uh, three-dimensional data, um, but um, meteorological data, we can even go up to four dimensions and then even five dimensions. If we talk about ensemble data, we uh, don't trust one form forecast at one specific um, uh, time, we actually let run the model um, 51 times to then generate um, the, the mean out of it. So, and this is, we, this is a much more reliable um, forecast. So data complexity uh, is, is a challenge for new, new data users. I conducted a user requirement survey at the beginning of this year, and uh, because I'm interested in who are the users, um, what tools they uh, use at the moment, um, but also what challenges they face, and uh, the fourth biggest challenges they identified is um, uh, limited processing capacity, the growing data volume, data are disseminated in a non-standardized way, and that there are too many platforms and portals, that users are just confused, they don't know where to find data, how to retrieve the data. Um, so it's probably growing data volume, it's uh, not a uh, big, pr uh, big surprise, surprises. But these challenges are very important to overcome and also to realize, uh, because if we don't specifically address them, then we just continuously um, uh, aggregating more and more data, um, and we have open data available in large data silos, but it's actually open locked data because no one can find them, no one can access them, and no one can, uh, can use them. So um, there, uh, there has been like kind of a competition, I feel, on conferences that yeah, people, they say, oh yeah, we generate uh, these and these uh, terabytes of data every day, and uh, oh no, we generate even more terabytes of data every day. And I would like to turn it around or encourage everyone, rather than to uh, think of, uh, okay, we generate so many, so much data to also ask, okay, how much of this open data that is actually produced is used? And this, um, to make the data usable, one specific prerequisite is um, to provide, um, to, to give data access to it. And there is a very important shift we have to go to from um, pure download services to more on-demand data services. And so we have a range of um, uh, different uh, types of uh, data access um, uh, ways um, for also the data I um, introduced at the beginning. Um, and 
that the most are still download services, but then now with Copernicus and also with the setup of the climate data store, um, there is a, is a, is a path towards um, more on-demand data services. For example, the climate data store toolbox um, will, similar to Google Earth Engine, um, have an online code editor. You can directly access the data. You can generate your workflow in Python, and then you can build a web application or a visualization, and you can just uh, save your plot. Um, so um, one, we, but it's also important important to um, uh, think of that, uh, yeah, we have different user communities, and different user communities use often different systems. So, for example, Google Earth Engine is used um, a lot by the Earth Observation community. Um, there's an example from the World Food Program. They develop at the moment a, a flood prediction um, model on, uh, on Google Earth Engine, but they're also interested actually in using ERA-5 data um, to, to make the model better. But the problem is, okay, how do, how do you actually bring it together? You can try to ingest the data, which um, if the systems are not uh, interoperable, it, uh, it can be challenging. Um, uh, so, and that's why we uh, decided, uh, or, um, uh, um, or I also believe in, that like, as long as the data systems are not interoperable, that mirror archives of data can be also bridges between different user communities. And so, um, I've been working on making a, a small subset of seven ERA-5 parameters available on Google Earth Engine, um, but the process to make them available is a very good example how systems are not interoperable, because in order to make data from one system, climate data store, to uh, Google's engine to make them available there. We have to download the data in GRIP or NetCDF. We have convert the data to GeoTIFF. We have to upload them to Google Cloud Platform, and then we have to ingest them to Google Earth Engine. And so the entire process to make seven era five parameters available, around um, four or five terabytes of data, it took around nine months. And this brings me to, uh, to the needs. And uh, one important need is, yes, systems have to interoperate uh, with each other, and data have to be easily exchangeable with each other. And this can be achieved with standards, um, and, but it has to be beyond, or it has to go beyond web mapping services, because we are data users and large volumes of data, um, we want to um, have the real access. So um, we also have to, we need more web coverage services and web processing services. The second need is, um, yeah, we have to make it easier uh, to handle and process the data um, with tools users use. And so Python and R are at the moment uh, the languages uh, data scientists use. And so, um, yeah, we need uh, uh, good and uh, handy wrappers and drivers to, to work with, these, uh, with the data. And ISMWF has been a, a put a strong focus on um, making it easier and also uh, bringing the custom-built software um, to the Python world, uh, specifically the last year. And the third need is, um, if we have these tools and the packages and the data, we also have to show how we can actually efficiently put this everything together. So we have to generate reproducible workflows um, and we have to train uh, data. If you like to discuss and talk about reproducibility, uh, please um, have a look at the reproducibility workshop at ECMWF. Um, we will dedicate three days uh, on this topic um, in mid of October. And um, so, now it's, uh, yeah, the question is, okay, where are we going? And uh, it's not a surprise, um, yeah, the cloud is the future. So ISMWF is involved in uh, quite a few cloud projects at the moment. Um, so, but this show, shows also that um, there's still a lot of question marks as well, how data services can be set up also on the perspective from data providers. And, um, but the good thing is uh, the user survey, I also ask users if they would be um, uh, motivated to migrate to cloud services, and 68% were interested or even very interested to migrate to cloud services to do their processing there. Um, 
But we have to keep in mind, not just, uh, just because of the fact we, we have a new um, system, we have cloud services, um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and it might be beneficial for users. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily mean that users also use the, uh, the systems. And so cloud is a paradigm change, and we have to keep in mind that change also always takes time. So to conclude this talk, I just would like to uh, give you three take-home messages. And the first one is um, a quote from Albert Einstein saying, problems cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. So I just wanted to say that um, yeah, we have to keep in mind in our day-to-day -day work, rather than to work on what is possible now, to think where do we want, what do we want to have in 10 and 20 years and work towards this path. The second take-home message is, uh, I think it's less, a problem, uh, less of a problem here in this community, um, make reproducibility and sharing to, a part, uh, to a, a part of your personal code of conduct. So see it as a chance rather than a hassle. And the third one is train others, share, and, uh, share your skills and also knowledge. Um, so what we discuss uh, during these days um, here and also in other conferences, we have to bring to universities, uh, we have to bring to companies and uh, public authorities to really train the next generation of geospatial practitioners. Um, and I like the, uh, the, the, uh, the resemblance from Vasily yesterday. So yeah, and I want to conclude it with yeah, just continue building bridges and I wish, wish everyone an inspiring Fosfuji. Thank you.